Hello, my name is David Turner and this is another episode of Lunar Poetry Shorts. We're at Eclectic Art Lab in front of this lot at Silence Found a Tongue. Hello! Yay. They wanted to whoop, but I told them not to. <laughs> Uh, today I'm joined by James Mackay. Hello, Good James. Evening. Hello, David. Uh, we're going to begin with a couple of poems. Yeah, that's right. In the beginning was the word, and the word was probably obscene. <laughs> but no one was quite awake enough to properly hear it, and I guess that makes it all right. Slightly after the beginning, we had coffee and a smoke, and we wondered what to do, and it was cold. So we burned the property ladder for firewood because we realised that ladders are just prison bars turned sideways, but mostly because it was cold and fires are pretty. Sometime approaching the middle, we had rumours of a long and slippery slope somewhere and rushed to fetch our sledges. After that, we sat a while in frozen mermaid tea rooms looking over Echo Beach. The sea came in to melt the snow, but things became no warmer. It was drifting to a close when we reached the end of the rainbow. We had a few beers and our smiles and our bellies shone all the brighter for them. Later on, we visited the tambourine man. He sang us songs. We weren't sleepy. And the only place we had to go was back to whence we came. Heading home, we took the long way round to hunt bear in the park, but there were none. Just a tribe of unfriendly Eskimo monopolizing the swings in the moonlight. Near the end, we laid us down in psychedelic blankets and made love to the shipping forecast. In poor visibility, I watched your Atlantic swell and shift in an area of unseasonable high pressure. And at the very end, we saw that it all had been excellent and we slept until it all began again. And then, uh, and then another one about getting a job. This is for you. Uh, you have to have lots of jobs, uh, being a poet. Uh, and this is about probably the worst one I ever had. This is about uh, when I was God, uh, just temporarily, on a casual basis. <laughs> The ad read short and sweet. Omnipotent creator type wanted for fucked up world. And to be honest, I needed the money. You know how it is. What was the price of everything? The hours seemed daunting, but they explained at the agency that freedom from the constraints of space and time was a standard clause in the contract. The job sole floor in their eyes was the relative lack of openings for further advancement. I said, I have no ambition. I just want to pay the rent. And they said that was just the kind of answer they were after. Though looking back on it, they must have been desperate, the job having been so long unfilled after the shock resignation of the previous employee. So I signed and went home dreaming. Extra bonus weekends in the middle of the week. Atomic bombs that do no harm and have a graceful fallout of pink butterflies go back and stop the Inquisition before a single heretic gets even slightly singed. I toyed with plans for a garden filled with every kind of dancing flower and foliage to sing a peaceful shade of music in one long Mediterranean evening for you and I, my love, to sit together through eternity. Though it doesn't take an all-knowing deity to figure out that still you wouldn't want to sleep with me. I don't remember much about the job. Too much having to be everywhere in the universe at once and people dying painfully all the time and not even being allowed to wax wrathful on the bad ones, it being out of line with the culture of mercy initiative they've been trying to introduce. If you ask me, the whole organisation is a fucking shambles. That whole freedom from space and time thing turns out to be a ruse designed to circumvent official controls on the length of the working week. I left the only way I could, by wiping every bit of consciousness that wasn't just plain, simple, armchair beatnik, something poet, lover of rain on urban pavements and the company of fellow 21st century type degenerates. One last thing. Before I walked, I whacked up the brightness, the colour and the volume on whatever portion of reality I might happen to inhabit for the amusement of my friends and the irritation of my enemies. So far it seems to be working. I feel bad sometimes about leaving them short-handed, but uh, no one lasts too long, they tell me. Not in that line of work. Thank you, James. All right. Hello, properly now. Hello, okay. properly. Um, first question, why poetry? Hmm. 
Because I am writing poetry, I guess, because I want to know what I'm going to write next. Uh, I've stood up in a room a little bit smaller than this, somebody's living room, at a house party 15 years ago. Uh, I didn't have any, I, all my friends were musicians, they were all standing up. We had this kind of talent show thing and I couldn't play any instruments or sing any songs. And about a week beforehand, I sat down, wrote a 10 minute poetry set, uh, of which that God one was, was in it at 15 years old. Uh, and it's just been addictive ever since. It's uh, never crossed my mind not to write poetry for 15 years, and it's never crossed my mind not to stand up and say it to lovely people like this. In that talent contest 15 yeah. years ago, did they have like a glittery ribbony thing hanging over the kitchen door you had to come for? <laughs> <laughs> not at that one, but we did it. We did it again, and we did it again, and then we got a regular slot in a cafe, and yes, glittery things did happen quite a lot <laughs> later on. I was I compared it for two years. It's called home cooking. Uh, it's still talked about in terms of awe in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, largely because we used to go on until three in the morning uh, until yeah. everyone was unconscious. <coughs> and and yes, and Maximo Park met at one of our gigs. There you go. You, you don't even you know, you know the Maximo Park. I, 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 do, I, do, yeah, you do. Know, yeah. I just don't know whether you should be mentioned in public. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> this is a personal gripe <laughs> of mine. <laughs> um, so, what have been the main influences over your writing and uh, development as a writer and performer? Well, uh, it went back to when I was a student. Uh, more than 20 years ago now because uh, I've got a good old-fashioned classical education I studied Latin and Greek and I spent my student days writing essays on Virgil and Horace and Pindar and all that difficult stuff and then I sat up all night reading the beats reading Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs and, and some of the minor ones some of the women Joanne Kiger particularly Diane de Prima um, and that's really my writing is in the space between the two of them so it's half counting feet, doing incredibly intense analyses of hexameter verse and all that kind of boring stuff. Uh, and the other half, sitting up in smoky rooms, um, listening to jazz, man, and, uh, and gen generally rebelling. I would argue that's um, equally as hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Maximo Park or jazz. <laughs> Ooh. 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 Maximum time. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I was certain jazz. you were going to defend jazz then. No, I'm defending jazz. Oh. I dislike Maximum Park. Oh, I see. No, you, you are mean, perfectly yeah. allowed to. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. It's kind of my show, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit you out, I don't mind. I'm sorry. No, I won't. I'll leave you in. I'm very humble like that. Um, we're going to get on to talk about the Edinburgh show yeah. that you're taking up to uh, Edinburgh of all places. <laughs> It's called the boy with the moon tattoo. Yeah, got that right. Uh, it's called the boy with the moon tattoo. Yeah. yeah. Um, and all of your poems today are taken from that. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They are. Uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. We'll take another poem first. Oh, okay. Longish one. Those two were pretty much the oldest poems that are still in my repertoire. This is this is brand new uh, from about two months ago, uh, and it's called uh, Faggot Hexameters. <laughs> This is a story about the first time someone called me a faggot. Also, a poem that embroiders the truth a bit. How could it not, when a memory is just a piece of the world, like a floor or a teacup, picking up cracks and mysterious stains? I was 18 years old and back in Newcastle for Christmas, having failed to get laid my whole first term at college. Still jailbait, the age of consent being still 21, and the tabloids and Tory grandees howling murderous triumph over a dead generation of queer men and warnings on local news from your local vicar. The gays are after your children. They actually used to broadcast that shit on Look North. Having left school, I fell into drinking with sports playing lads who would never have looked at me mere weeks before in the kind of Neanderthal bars I'd spent my whole drinking career keeping out of for safety. School days have stopped feeling safe around 12 or 13. I don't like to dwell on the grim masturbatory treadmill of male adolescence. My first memories of sexual desire, green shoots springing rotten out of the ground, milk teeth with abscesses already in them. My God, the shame hells of sweat steamy changing rooms where the wrong boy was always the pasture your famished eyes were most desperate to graze. This boy, for example, 
open neck shirt, suggestion of chest hair, fear of my schoolboy days and hero of many a pillaring schoolboy night. No one used your arousal to keep you afraid quite as deftly as this guy. This one at the bar, his attention distracted by some passing pussy. His word, not mine. And while we're on language, the word we all knew for putting someone in his place was gay for marking him out or starting a fight or making him cry was gay, whereas faggot was alien, a word from the underground movies and J.D. Salinger, four colour sleaze and a world of alarm and adventure and, to be honest, where gay meant at best a high-functioning unit kind of existence, faggot meant one day I might just get laid. Anyway, week before Christmas, back in the hometown, and that guy finally sees who I am. Get that fucking faggot away from me! Bursts on my head like a baptism. First time he's taken the slightest notice of me in public, and I'm not about to do anything that tears me away from those fearful, beautiful eyes, and it's him looks down first, in a way that I now know a lover sometimes submits. The lads laugh and he leaves and I stay and the century turns. We discovered the ones that were really after your children were the respectable church-going types on the news. Terrified, it now becomes clear that the gays would get to the dear little children first. Things get better. Not everywhere, not without effort, but always. Even the Newcastle Arms has gone all leather sofas and lattes, but that's a whole other story. And this was a poem about when I learned that it's not so much words as intentions. Still rather you call me faggot than gay, to be frank, though I don't lose much sleep. In the world we all want, there'll be no need to specify, will there? Thank you for listening. Hey. Hey. Here's James. Yeah, um, I think they will like that. You bloody shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The boy with a Moomin tattoo. Right, boy with a Moomin tattoo. About? Well, it is about... Well, look, here's the Moomin tattoo. Do we have Moomin fans in the audience? Yeah. James has revealed a... a t which, which character is that? That's Snufkin. Snufkin. Snufkin on his right bicep. <laughs> for those who are living in, in the internet. Do we have anyone who's never heard of the Moomins before? In which case, I need to explain to you, uh, the Moomin books are the greatest works of uh, writing of the 20th century. Uh, to the Anson, uh, I'm absolutely serious. Uh, Philip Pullman is campaigning as we speak to get her a posthumous Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, she was an illustrator, artist, writer, cartoonist, grew up in a very bohemian enclave, a small island and a fjord in the north of Finland, in Swedish-speaking Finland. Uh, and wrote this series of books. They were translated in the 60s. You're going to hear about them this year. There's a movie out at the moment. All sorts of stuff. And uh, they're the best books ever. They're the first books I ever remember buying. I bought Comet in Moomin Land for five pence at the school jumble sale when I was seven years old. And I still have that copy. Uh, I read them, reread them, grew up with them uh, until my last summer at college, I got Snufkin, who's my hero tattooed on my arm. Uh, all he owns in the world is his green dress and his mouth organ, uh, and he travels around. Moomins hibernate, but Snufkin doesn't. Snufkin goes travelling in the winter when the Moomins hibernate, uh, and has adventures with the Hattie Fatners, who are small electrical creatures that grow from seed. Uh, <laughs> but you're never allowed to know what he does, because Moomin Mama doesn't think it's suitable. <laughs> so you, you, ne you never get to find out what Snufkin does with that. You get hints later on in the books, but you never really get to find out. And so I had this done, and, uh, and I was casting around for a show to do this year in Edinburgh, and it occurred to me that uh, it's been 20 years now since Snufkin has been on my arm. Uh, when I had him done, I had no idea that I was going to end up standing up in front of rooms of people trying to entertain them. I had no idea I'd be travelling for a living, which I now do. I'm a tour guide. I spend my summer travelling around the UK and around Europe with groups of coach groups of people. And in general, my life's just got more and more moomin ever since I've, I've had it done. So, uh, so what I was trying to do, what I wanted to do was to, to pick out some of my, like all of my poems for the last 15 years and pick out ones that have moomin-y kind of themes. People who know the books will know. Uh, Tuvi Janssen writes a lot about the seasons, a lot about tolerating people who you don't particularly like, uh, a lot about nostalgia and melancholy. There's a lot of that and a lot about the North. So a lot of the poems are about 
uh, growing up in Newcastle and having family that come from Shetland and that kind of thing. Uh, and so really, it, it's a retrospective all hinged around quotes from the Moomin books. Yeah. I really love Tall Grey Amsterdam. Yes, Which absolutely. Great, yeah, 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 really ab- absolutely. Have you ever seen her illustrations for The Hobbit? No. Okay. Tuve Janssen, this is only going to mean anything to Tuve Janssen fans, but it will mean a lot to you. She did illustrations for a 1950s Norwegian edition of The Hobbit. And I saw one copy of it once in that really expensive children's bookshop in Cecil Court, just by Leicester Square. And it had the cover off, and it was really stained, and it was really badly damaged, and he still wanted 350 quid for it, which tells me it's quite rare. She's, yeah, she's yeah. very collectible. She's very collectible. But her Hobbit is fantastic, much better than by far the best Bilbo Baggins I've ever seen. He's kind of wearing his, his helmet's far too big for him and the armor's far too big and he looks a little bit kind of shy and awkward and he's sort of standing there looking, oh, it's just fantastic. So um, what form does the show take? Ah, what, what form do we have here now? It's a poetry show. Yeah. So, so it's me standing up. Uh, in is front there of any uh, monologues linking the poems? Or is yeah, it yeah, yeah I've got, I'm going to have my Moomin books with me. Yeah. Uh, and we've got notable bits that I'm going to actually read out bits to the Anson, which I hope isn't going to get in the way of copyright too much. <laughs> the Free Fringe, which I'm on in Edinburgh, actually is copyright free because we're not charging admission. You yeah. just put the bucket around. So actually, you can do the Rocky Horror Show if you yeah. want on the Free Fringe, and no one's going to come after you if you want to do that. Uh, so I think that's all right. It's going to be touring it later, it's going to be the problem. Uh, I just hope if I wave the books around and every time I pick one up say available from Penguin Books the price is 7 95 uh, that'll stop them coming after me because yeah. Uh, yeah I have no idea I have no idea, I have no idea. nobody seems to have any idea no. how much is fair you just use just don't stop just keep going keep yeah. moving they can't get you can yeah exactly works. yeah <laughs> and where, where's the show going to be on uh, it's going to be on in the Lizard Lounge Electric Circus which is down by Waverley Station at yeah. 3 15 in the afternoon and it's a good slot. Have you gone about developing the show? Have you just done individual poems at Open Mic, or have you uh, scratched it? For all of these things, all of these poems are ones that I've been doing. I mean, they're, they're, they're 15 years worth of, yeah. of, of greatest hits. So they're all poems that I know and I've done before, but I'm working with uh, Matt Panish, Monkey Poet, uh, who seems to be directing half the spoken word shows on the Free Fringe this year and putting everybody in the right slot. So I've had a couple of quite intensive sessions with him. Uh, apparently I'm to do some of them more like Laurence Olivier and some of them more like Viv Stanchel. Those are my director's notes. Uh, so uh, come and see it, you'll find out how I get on with that. Uh, have you been up to Edinburgh before? Yes, I have. Uh, this is going to be my seventh free fringe. Okay. But in the past, I used to work with Richard Tyron Jones uh, yes. as part of Utter Spoken Word. Uh, it was Richard who practically killed himself getting Spoken Word, the, the, the foothold that he's got in the fringe. So uh, I went up in 2009 when we were at Fingers. Fingers Piano Bar on the far side of the tram and no one could get to us and, and no one was there. And then in 2010, just helping out with Utter and 2010 was the year that everyone was in the Banshee Labyrinth, which is for non-Edinburgh people, but <laughs> that, Banshee Labyrinth is Poet Central pretty much, this amazing venue. And Richard had managed to program all spoken word in all five rooms. Uh, and we had Mark and Mixie, dead poets, would go in at 12 and do their show. They'd then sit in the bar uh, and all the poets, as they finished their shows, would be trapped by the dead poets on their way out. And by the time Utter came on at half seven, everyone was legless. And by the time it got to midnight, yeah, you know, it was messy, but, uh, but beautiful. Well, uh, this is a, I think this is a shit question, but I, I can't. It's at the front of my... It's in here now, so it's ready to come out. Uh, do you have any advice for people that are going up to Edinburgh for the first time? Um, I mean, how to develop the show, not particularly what they do when they get there, but in terms of tying things up maybe. Well, if you're going up for the first time, I don't think there's any advice can help you. And you <laughs> <say that>. <laughs> no, <laughs> no really you until you, until you've done until you've done the yeah, three yeah. until you've done the three weeks and until you've had yeah. the, the, the not even it's not the rowdy audience is the problem, it's it's the it's the random three people sitting in opposite <laughs> corners, uh, sleeping through the gig or skinning up through the gig mm-hmm. or just just not being at the, I mean it's just until you've done it I mean that's why it's so valuable there's few other places where you can just go day after day after day after day and do it I think probably the thing is don't try and make it too long the hour long slot especially on the free fringe but you don't want more than 40 minutes 45 minutes of material because there will be heckled and you can always chat to people beforehand and you will want time to and you don't want to be getting to the end to your big finish and with the, the guys coming afterwards, standing in the door, like looking <laughs> daggers at you, <laughs> going, you should have finished two minutes ago. So yeah, keep it short, I think. Keep it, keep it 45 minutes, allow yourself 15 minutes for getting in, getting out, chatting. 
Yeah. Yeah, that'll take a lot of pressure off. Speaking of keeping it short, should we get on to some more poems? Yeah, I guess some more poems. <laughs> right. Well, you don't have to rush. Just <laughs> uh, I believe very strongly that uh, all poetry sets should have uh, cover versions in them. Uh, I know a lot of musicians that how I started was uh, was being friends with musicians and working with musicians, and they think it's absolutely astounding that anyone, especially when they're beginning performing, would sit down and try and do a set of originals. I mean, you wouldn't do that. You don't do that if you're a huge band playing Stadia. Why on earth are we doing this in small rooms? So I developed a line in uh, cover versions. Last couple of years ago, I did a show entirely of cover versions uh, called The New Popular Reciter, where I became a Victorian parlour reciter with my Victorian parlour reciter's hat. James has uh, a hat on now. I've got a hat Just on now. Just hat on. Yeah, because yeah, I, I need you to get into character. Um, and so this is, my, uh, this is my cover version that I'm going to do from this show. Uh, it is an object lesson in, to everyone in how to cope with a bad review. Uh, poets in the audience... You've had bad reviews, right? Everyone's had bad reviews. And the temptation is to become more bitter and twisted and hate humanity, and, and that's fine. Uh, but if you can possibly manage it, do this. This is how Roger Kipling coped with a bad review. Uh, he had a stinker of a review from a man called Mr. Trail, uh, a real stinker of one I can tell you about afterwards if you want. And this is his response. It's called In the Neolithic Age. In the Neolithic Age... Savage warfare did I wage for food and fame and woolly horses pelt. I was singer to my clan in that dim red dawn of man, and I sang of all we fought and feared and felt. Yea, I sang as now I sing, when the prehistoric spring made the pale, blah, blah, the pale, blah, blah. you see, this is right, uh, made the piled Biscayan ice pack split and shove. And the troll and gnome and dwerg and the gods of cliff and berg were about me and beneath me and above. But a rival of Salutre told the tribe my style was outre. Neath a tomahawk of diorite he fell. And I left my views on art barbed and tanged below the heart of a mammothistic etcher at Grinnell. That I stripped them. Scalp from skull and my hunting dogs fed full and their teeth I threaded neatly on a thong. And I wiped my mouth and said, It is well that they are dead, for I know my work is right and theirs is wrong. But my totem saw the shame. From his ridgepole shrine he came and he told me in a vision of the night, There are nine and sixty ways of constructing tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. Then the silence closed upon me till they put new clothing on me of whiter, weaker flesh and bone more frail. And I stepped beneath time's finger once again, a tribal singer and a minor poet certified by trail. Still a cultured Christian age sees a scuffle, squeak and rage. Still we pinch and slap and jabber, scratch and dirk. Still we let our business slide as we dropped the half-dressed hide to show a fellow savage how to work. Still the world is wondrous large, seven seas from marge to marge, and it holds a vast of various kinds of man. And the wildest dreams of Q are the facts in Kathmandu, and the crimes of Clapham chased in Mataban. Here's my wisdom for your use, as I learned it when the moose and the reindeer roamed where Paris roars tonight. There are nine and sixty ways of constructing tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. So, so with that... With that plea for you know, diversity and, and tolerance and everything being right, let me hasten to tell you what I think is right. Uh, this is, is a poem called We Are All Grandbabies. Young and hungry, I suppose being a poet to consist mainly in garrets and coffee shops drafting urgent manifestos. Having on the whole since eaten rather well and managed these 15 years without writing a single one, here it is. It is to be immeasurably deep, naked and kind. First of all, kind to the ladies and gentlemen. It is their evening after all, then deep, long in the roots, tooth strong and naked in an emperor's new charity shop suit of old empty, over empty street side, under empty next to the skin and deep 
which from another point of view is high. Kind for what is childish now may yet turn out to have been most grown up after all and kind to all the people just trying to make a living. They are naked too. Actors wear costumes. Poets supply our own nakedness. Book the right floor show. Every house is a bawdy house. Deep down to the empty gut and laughs. Naked and unafraid. Deep and rising. Kind and quite prepared to look like an idiot. It sees a spade and naked it says spade. A poet and says poet. And it knows less respectable four letter words than that. But kind is often to speak gentlier. Deep we are few. Kind, we are many and all of us naked grandbaby poets and we speak beautifully each to another. Kind to sisters and brothers of all tribes, even those who don't know yet that Howl and Other Poems is the best book ever, closely followed by Moomin Valley in November. Deep, because this is no desk job and kind to yourself at the end that whatever your burdens sit lightly, your work songs be taken for skylarking and victory. Thank you, James. That's it. Um, what's your What's your blog? Uh, um, MackayPoetry.com. Yeah, That's no, what it is. M C K A Y. And yeah. it'll be in the description of this uh, thing here, uh, and uh, and information about the show. Um, that's not relevant to the people in the room. It's for the internet people. One more round of applause, please. <laughs> 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 Thank you.